So I'm Lisa Walker from Hyattsville Aging in Place. Um, corridor Conversations, we've been running this since January of 2021. Um, it's a partnership of the various villages along Route 1, which includes Helping Hands University Park, Neighbors Helping Neighbors College Park, and Explorations and Aging College Park. We've done monthly programs now for a while, for those almost a year, well, certainly a year and a half. And um, we've been recording them and this will go up on, um, on our website afterwards and on a YouTube link. The program is supported uh, by, the, by a grant, a small grant from uh, the city of Hyattsville, which we're very thankful to have and hope to have it in the future. Anyway, as I, as I said, it's a real treat to have Maggie here. I've known Maggie for a while. She um, began uh, uh, with bees in 2012 with one colony. I guess that's one hive. I think that even if you're afraid of bees, you're going to learn a lot today. And Maggie does say that she raises gentle bees. So I want to know how she does that, but I think we'll find out. Um, she quickly expanded to 40 colonies in three years, and she says it's all without purchasing commercial queen, so we may want to have her talk about that a little bit. She now owns, as many of us know, a, a thriving business called Hope Honey Farm, um, which is in Hyattsville. It's the only certified naturally grown apiary inside the Beltway. And in addition to selling her famous honey, she's added soaps, lip balm, body butter, and she also sells colonies and queens, focusing on raising hygienic gentle bees who overwinter well. Um, she, as time allows, she also teaches beekeepers how to handle swarms, so she, I think she will talk about that. She's appeared on many programs, Maryland Public Television, has worked with beekeepers in many places in the world, including Belize. She loves to travel. So Belize, Guatemala, um, Granada, Turkey, and Kenya. And she's served in uh, leadership positions in DC and Maryland uh, um, about bees and bee colonies. It's gonna be really fun. So why don't you take it away there, Maggie? We're ready to go. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for that intro. And, and I think one thing that isn't, isn't shared there is that this isn't my full-time job. I, I have a full-time job. And so I think some people find that a bit surprising. Uh, it is a lot. And I am really excited to be here and share with you. I wanted to point something out on this first slide. I don't know if uh, I don't know if there's a pointer. I don't know if I need one, but right there on the bee that's on the clover, that's called crimson clover. You can see a little bit of propolis on the where where I suppose a knee would be if a bee had a knee. Uh, you can see just a little bit of brown propolis. So I wanted to just highlight that. We're going to talk more about some of uh, some of the products of the hive that we know about and some of them that we might not know about and then their purposes. So let's get started. Uh, who were the, who were the, whoops who were the first beekeepers? Uh, so we do know that beekeeping was first recorded in 2422 BC and and it was recorded in ancient Egypt. Illustrations were found on the walls of the Sun Temple. And so we, we can date it back to that. Honey was a treasure since it was the first source of sweetness discovered outside of fruits and berries. They hadn't, uh, they hadn't discovered, you know, granulated sugar like we get in the, in the grocery store. So honey was quite prized. And they also knew that it was used as an, uh, that it had antiseptic values and that it was an al also a great preservative. We know that beekeepers in Israel kept horizontal clay hives, which are shown there in the photo on the right. Um, and these clay tubes are dating back to 900 BC. This, this beekeeping method is still used in Israel. And then you might recognize the image on the left bottom uh, this is this is the famous beehive photo. If you think of the Utah State license plate, you'll see a skep hive uh, there. This this is the uh, 
a basket that's made from straw, and they date back to the medieval times. They're called the skep. Um, skep hives are still being made and used worldwide. They're considered a lost art. But in the United States, unfortunately, this is not a legal way to maintain bees. And the primary reason is because it's not, it's not functional and therefore it can't be inspected for a disease. The other disadvantage to the skep hive is that in order to harvest, you have to destroy all of the comb. And we'll learn about how valuable the comb is to the bees later in the talk. So, so uh, let's talk about what we use in modern times for beekeeping. So the photo on the left is a colony in my backyard a couple years ago, and that's called the Langstroth, the Langstroth hive. And then the colony on the right is a top bar. We know those as a Kenyan top bar hive. Uh, they're not as often maintained here in Maryland and these, these parts that get much colder the we know heat travels up and the top bar hive being horizontal doesn't have the advantages of holding the heat like the langstroth hive does where the heat travels upward and the bees can kind of follow that or get to the top where it's at the warmest um, and why was what does langstroth mean well we may know we may remember the name lorenzo langstroth he invented this in 1851. He was considered the father of beekeeping or the father of modern beekeeping. And his hive remains very popular because it, it allows a beekeeper to, to reuse drawn comb. And in the top bar hive, the comb must be crushed and destroyed to extract the honey. So uh, this next slide talks about the agricultural importance of bees, and it's widely reported that one in three bites of food directly or indirectly depends on pollination by honeybees. This is impressive if you think about it. Uh, a $15 billion industry, which makes it the third largest agricultural crop value behind beef and pork. Migratory beekeepers are solely responsible for ensuring the pollination of crops, such as almonds in California. And in 2012, there were record losses, and they believed that almonds would suffer because the bees were not available, the, uh, the record losses of bees due to, uh, it was originally reported as colony collapse disorder, but we know a lot more now uh, about what caused that, and it's a present uh, present concern, the, the Varroa destructor, it's a mite. We'll talk more about that. So um, uh, at home, bees pollinate more than 16% of flowers in our gardens. And this number would be much higher if we planted flowers, trees, and shrubs, which were attractive to pollinators. In 2020, the U.S. honey value exceeded 299 million. That's a uh, so the, the value in 2002 was 130 million. So it's more than doubled. And if we go back to a $15 billion industry, we can see there's so much more to honeybees than just honey. So let's talk, let's talk more. Um, and, and I think many of us have seen this on social media, your, your grocery store with bees, your grocery store without bees. Um, and then I want to, I really want to highlight the difference between the wasp, the honeybee, and the bumblebee. And kind of going back to what Lisa said about gentle bees, I, I, I just I, I think I think people believe I'm crazy when they find out I'm a beekeeper, and when they learn that I rarely wear a full bee suit, and most often I'm in the hive with a t-shirt and just a veil to protect my face. The truth is, honeybees in general are very docile and rarely sting. But that doesn't mean beekeeping should be taken lightly. Well, I'm, I am happy to give you something in writing. I'm going to be the one who's paying for it, Joel. So oh, 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 oh. <laughs> I, we should <laughs> probably catch. Um, hi, yeah. Anne. Sorry, we're going to get you muted. Um, Sorry. No, no, no. That doesn't mean beekeeping should be taken lightly, and we'll talk more about that later, but it means we shouldn't be terrified of bees. Most people who have been stung, quote, by a bee, Bee, have actually been stung by a wasp or a hornet, which are often very aggressive and territorial. 
Many wasps are carnivores and don't pollinate, but are very important because they prey on common garden pests. Wasps have a smooth stinger and can sting multiple times. However, honeybees have a barbed stinger, which pulls out during a sting, and that, die, that bee will die after stinging. Finally, the bumblebee, which is not aggressive, can sting multiple times because they also have a smooth stinger. So I hope these photos help us to think about what we're actually um, perceiving as being aggressive or defensive or uh, that we take notice of what's stinging us. And I think valuing these pictures might be important if you have uh, a pest in your house, if you think you might have honeybees, um, maybe Google what they look like and compare these photos. You see the wasp there has a very slender waist and it doesn't have any fur, um, whereas the honeybee is fuzzy and the bumblebee is fuzzy. So I'll start getting a lot of calls in the fall and those people will think they have a nest of honeybees, but 99 times out of 100, there are wasps that are trying to get in for uh, before the winter. So, uh, you know, just do a quick Google. If you do reach out to me, try and send a photograph and um, I'll help you out. So uh, this photo shows what is happening when the honeybee stings. You see the stinger is stuck there and the entire digestive tract is pulling out and that's causing the bee to die. So this is a really awesome photo. I know we might cringe to see it, but it's pretty fascinating to me. And then the photo at the bottom is actually a photo I took with my cell phone with a, a microscope at one of my very first workshops that I did on beekeeping. And I just, I was really happy with the photo. And I remember really the first time I saw this and just saw all the little barbs on the honeybee and just studying the body. It was just so fascinating to me. So I wanted to share these. Um, so let's talk about some tips. If you do get stung, you should remove the stinger as soon of, as soon as possible. And I think these, these tips work for any sort of uh, stinging insect. You want to make sure you remove the stinger as soon as possible. And then there is some relief that can be found placing ice on the sting or even applying a paste made of baking soda and water. I'm not sure what uh, the components are that, that cause that enable that to be a relieving thing, uh, but many people do get relief from that. And I, I wanted to talk just for a moment, realizing that I'm not a physician. I don't have any training in uh, medicine, but so many people say, oh, I'm allergic to bees. And I always ask, well, what happens if you get stung? Oh my gosh, I swell. My, the, the spot around the sting swells. It gets red and puffy and hot and it itches. And so that is a normal reaction. That isn't an allergic reaction. Again, I'm not a doctor. And if you get stung and you have concerns, you should absolutely seek medical attention. But, but an actual allergic reaction is often um, more extreme. So it would be swelling or itching in other areas of the body. Like if you got stung on your arm, you might have itching and swelling or tightness in your leg. Well, that's, that's not a normal response. Or if you have tightness in your throat or, or hives, those, those are more extreme examples but, um, and, and allergic. So um, we know anaphylaxis, that's a true allergy. But if you just get red and swell and you're uncomfortable for a few days, that's a pretty normal local reaction. So uh, if you do get if you do get some of the other uh, greater reactions like anaphylaxis, tightness in your throat, um, heart palpitations, then you should certainly seek attention immediately. And lastly, getting statistics is tough, but in 2000, the World Health Organization that reported in the U.S., there were only 54 deaths attributable to bee stings from a population of 281 million. So, it's pretty rare to be considered allergic. Uh, I don't actually have the data on that, but it's like one in 100,000, I think. It's, it's a very low number. 
So switching gears, let's talk about what the makeup of the hive is. And so the first picture on the left is the worker bee and the worker bees are always female. And uh, I know this goes against the bee movie. Uh, I forget what it was called. Years ago came out as a super cute, um, super cute, super cute movie. And uh, in that movie, the, uh, the, the worker bees were all boys, but that's actually not accurate. And um, maybe it's how society needs us to think that the, that the, the men, the boys do the work, but in reality for honeybees, it's, it's the worker bees being the girls that are out there. Um, some of the primary rules of worker bees are nurse bees, and foragers, uh, nurse bees, just like it sounds, they're the bees who care for the babies. The babies are also known as the brood. Foragers have the shortest lifespan. They're older and they leave the hive to bring in pollen, nectar, and propolis. And that, that explains why they have the shorter lifespan because they're out there doing the riskier work. In the colony, there's only one queen and she lays all the eggs but she really doesn't do any work. In fact, she has a collection of bees who feed her, care for her, and remove waste from the hive, including her waste, her excrement they carry out of the hive. She can't be bothered with those details. She's much too busy laying eggs. And the drone bee on the right is the male bee. He doesn't have a stinger. He doesn't do any work in the hive, and his only role is to fertilize the queen. But a drone does not fertilize his mother. Instead, drones leave the colony and spend their day at a place called a drone congregation site. I think of this as single bars for bees. He waits for virgin queens, a virgin queen to fly through the area. And she is usually mated by 13 to 24 drones. Upon mating, the drones die and the queen will return to her colony that's typically the only time she will ever leave the colony, except if she were to swarm. So uh, the queens are about seven days old when they, when they go on that mating flight. And um, they, they store all of the sperm from the 13 to 24 drones that they mated with. They store it inside their body for the duration of their life, which uh, could, be, could be five years. For me, it's more two or three years. Uh, I think... I think older beekeepers would say that queens could live up to seven years, but I think there are a lot of new pressures that weren't there maybe 50 years ago when, um, when, we, had, when, when we had fewer pesticide pressures and other, other issues. So she stores the sperm in something called a spermatheca, and uh, we're not going to get into the details of that, but one of the reasons I think beekeeping is, is so fascinating is just how this all works. So we are actually going to do a virtual hive inspection, and this is what the colony looks like from the outside. You see the two bottom boxes are bigger, they're deeper. Those are actually called deeps. These boxes hold 10 frames, and we'll look closer at the frames. And then you'll see in the middle, there's a piece of wood there. That is actually called a queen excluder, and that keeps uh, that keeps the queen from passing into the upper boxes which are called supers and the upper boxes are where the honey is stored the queen excluder is there just like it sounds to keep the queen from going up into those honey supers and laying eggs and raising brood up there because we don't really want that in our honey uh, we want those frames to be free of, of baby bees and brood and, and also pollen. If there's no brood, the, uh, the bees won't deposit pollen. So it's pure honey up top. And we'll see more of these photos. In the front, you see at the entrance, there's a little piece of wood and a mason jar. This is how we provide water to the bees. Uh, this was my first year beekeeping and, um, I, I have different sources now, usually where they're able to find water closer to home. Um, the smoker is the next tool that we'll talk about. The smoker is used to, uh, 
to confuse the bees, to reduce their ability to transmit signals using pheromones. Bees communicate so much with pheromones. And when we, when we puff a little bit of cool smoke at the bees, it, um, it maybe sends the message that their colony or the forest is on fire and they should fill up their honey stomachs and prepare to make a quick escape. So um, that keeps the bees calmer when doing an inspection. They're, it's one of the most difficult things to master is providing cool smoke. Uh, it's, it's quite a technique to be able to master the, uh, the use of the smoker and applying just the right amount. Too much smoke can actually overstress the bees and make them more defensive. Using the wrong material in the smoker can also be really disruptive. Uh, I remember seeing on Facebook recently some suggestion about using cannabis in the smokers. Uh, uh, and I, I got a pretty good laugh out of that. You know, everybody would be really happy if we, if we put cannabis in, in the smokers. Uh, but, uh, and, the, and then there were also memes about um, bees pollinating the cannabis flowers. But in reality, cannabis, you can think of more like a pine tree, a pine cone, and uh, the bees don't actually pollinate that. There's not there's not any nectar or really pollen from that. Um, same with corn, although the bees will sometimes collect pollen from the from corn. It's a wind pollinated crop. All right, so getting back to the colony, this is opening the hive. This was my first year. You see, I have uh, I have big gloves on. I was pretty nervous. I, I don't work like that anymore. I, uh, I I'm much more comfortable now and just wear a t-shirt. I don't. Um, I I do wear a veil just to protect my face from a sting if a bee gets caught in my hair, it won't be able to get out. So uh, I do wear the veil, but definitely uh, much too hot to be wearing the jacket and all the extra stuff now. So uh, this was a nucleus colony. It was five frames of bees, which you can see the five frames there in the center. It was my first year and the frames surrounding those first five frames, those are brand new uh, frame. So this was this was a very early inspection for me. All right. So what did we find in there? Uh, this uh, this is labeled to see the larva uh, in the center. You can see a lot of these little worms, and uh, they are rolling around in uh, in um, uh, the the food source that is that the workers secrete to give them or uh and and so they just they roll around in this and they soak up all the nutrients and then uh as they get bigger for example that be uh, the larva up at the top is one of the largest uh it will get capped over and you can see that fuzzy little waxy capping that uh, the bees add. And then if we look down toward the bottom center, you can see the little teeny, teeny uh, eggs, and they look like a grain of rice when you're inspecting. And uh, the frames I use have black plastic foundation, and they're just, they're, they're the frame with a sheet of black plastic foundation that has the hexagon grid on it. And the bees draw out the, the cell itself. And so the black foundation makes it so much easier to see the eggs and the larva. But back in the day, they didn't have, you know, as much plastic. And so they used wax foundation. And it's a lot harder to see a white egg on a natural colored wax foundation. So it's one of the advantages I have over Lorenzo Langstroth is uh, this, this black foundation. So um, I'll pause for just a minute to see if there are any questions that have come through. We good, Carter? I haven't, I haven't seen any questions. Okay. I, I actually had one quick one. Do the bees lay the, lay the eggs in a certain order in the hive? Is like, I mean, looks like the larva are top or above and the eggs are below here. They fill it from like top to the bottom or 
is a random. You know, they, uh, so in the, at the beginning of the year, starting in January with the, um, with with the uh, equinox, they will start. It's just the queen laying the eggs, and she will start picking up brood production. Um, so starting now, as we've just uh, passed the solstice, she's going to start laying fewer and fewer. You can think of it as the days getting longer, the days getting shorter, and um, she will look for open cells. But she's also going to be mindful of her workforce and who can keep those bees warm. So it's primarily in the center. If you think about the big box, and, and I think this might, we might get even get into it more. This, this slide here explains uh, how in the center is the brood where the, the colony is able to keep it the warmest in the center. And then surrounding that is the pollen. And then in the third layer, you see the capped honey. And then uh, on the left side, uh, that would also that's going to be nectar that they're drawing down. That's uh, that would that would be on the left side. You can see a little bit of the shine of some nectar that's plopped in with the pollen there. Um, I don't know if I have a picture that's going to give us more detail on the pollen, but from here you can see all the color ranges there, all the different flowers that are that are. Um, providing pollen. I see some bright orange. Uh, there's often blue pollen, red pollen, uh, many shades of gray, and then many shades of yellow. It's quite fascinating uh, what, they, what they collect. So we're going to talk uh, here about the queen. You see, this is a, a beautiful photo. I can't take credit for this. Uh, this was a queen that I grafted at one of my first uh, beekeeping workshops. I um, I did a, a seminar on queen grafting, and it's where you move the tiniest, tiniest larva to a cell and manipulate the colony to raise a queen. And I actually brought back those grafted cells uh, out of the Penn State breeding program and have had really good luck with them. So just such a beautiful photo here. Uh, that somebody shared with me. So you can see her in comparison to the worker bees. And it might make sense to you now why some people put an, uh, a marker dot on their queen so they're easier to find because it's sort of like looking for a needle in a haystack, trying to locate the queen with all those bees. So how does the queen start out? How is she different from the worker bees? And we can take this back to when she was an egg. She's the exact same egg that a worker bee would, uh, would have been. But the bees are feeding her this super rich, super food. Uh, uh, oh, I just had... Uh, oh, my goodness. Uh, I, oh, uh, so they're going to feed her royal jelly. I just had a complete brain erase. Um, so they're going to feed her royal jelly, which is going to be the superfood that makes her bigger, stronger, faster, better. And it's going to be what makes her a queen. So going back for uh, raising queens, we can take one of these little teeny, teeny larval cells. We can move them to uh, a separate cup, a queen cup, and we can manipulate the colony to believe that it doesn't have a queen and get them to turn those little cups into queens for us. So that's how I do queen rearing. And for me, I uh, am focused on varroa sensitive hygienic bees and uh, the, the PBS segment, which is available online if you Google Maryland Farm and Harvest, episode 601. Uh, it was the season premiere for Maryland Farm and Harvest, and it actually won an Emmy Award for videography. So I, I really encourage you, if you want to see more about how I, uh, I make queens, that will, that will get into it a little more. And the video is really amazing. They did re-air it as the season finale in uh, season eight, but the original season six uh, is a little is a little bit more extensive. So, here is a photo of a queen cell. Oh my goodness, I couldn't find royal jelly, and it's right there at the top at top of my slides. Funny how our brains work, right? So, uh, Lisa mentioned a little bit about swarming. 
Swarming is a natural reproductive process the bees go through generally in the spring. Swarming season has essentially passed. We may get a few random swarms here and there, but here are a couple photos of what a swarm looks like. And so when, when you do contact me, if you do contact me, uh, certainly please call or email if you see something Thing like this in your yard or nearby, and I'd be happy to come and collect it. But this is also something to, um, to um, compare and contrast if you think you have honeybees, but you actually have wasps. Uh, I hope these are photos that you, that you stick in your, in your mind. You see how brown the, the honeybees are, whereas wasps are generally a bright yellow or even white with the European hornets. So um, here's a picture of me collecting. Uh, it's actually the, the swarm on the right. This is me collecting it. And uh, this was my second year as a beekeeper. And I was really terrified. I know you don't see it there, but I had seen this on YouTube and I had um, seen some, some really respected beekeepers just handle the bees. And it was beyond anything I could imagine that you could just put your hands into this ball of honeybees and you could just collect them and not get stung to pieces. So uh, this is one of my very favorite things now that I'm much more confident and shake a lot less when I collect bees this way. Uh, it's one of my favorite things to share with people who are passing by, just how gentle, how docile swarms are. And uh, in this case, the bees have filled their honey stomachs with honey, and they are preparing to find a new place to live. They've left all of their resources behind for a brand new baby queen, and they've left with the mature mama queen, and they're going to just start over and, and leave everything to the kids, so to speak. Uh, and so they're really not interested in defending this spot they have on the chain link fence there. They're only staying there temporarily and they have a really cool democratic process where they have uh, scout bees that go out and they look for spaces. And there's a book written by Tom Seeley and it's called The Honeybee Democracy. And I think society, I think humans could learn about how they go about their politics, how they go about voting for the best place to live and how they have really solid established rules for that. It's a fascinating, fascinating story. It is a little bit scientific in some, uh, in some ways, but it's just a, it's a really, really great experience. And it just teaches you how fascinating and amazing bees are. We talked a little about the pollen, and this is a photo of the pollen coming in. Uh, you can see the little Cheetos colored pollen. This is one of my favorite colors of pollen. Uh, and I think it maybe comes from the little crocus that come up in the yards early in the spring. It's, it's generally one that I see pretty early. But then I think I also see it again late uh, coming into the fall. So maybe it's an aster pollen later in the year. Oh, so this is this is where I think that Cheetos color comes from, these little crocus. I forgot I had this here. And then we did talk about this early on, the uh, propolis that's on the leg of this honeybee there. Um, I, I forget if we... I think we might talk a little about propolis in a minute, uh, but in case we don't, I just want to say that uh, propolis is what gives... Uh, beeswax its smell, that really amazing smell that we think of when we smell beeswax. And the bees collect it from the resins of trees and they use it to seal cracks around the colony and they use it to insulate. And it's my, my, microbial, uh, sorry, um, <laughs> antibacterial. And uh, it's a really wonderful thing. You hear about propolis being used in tinctures and uh, for medicinal purposes. So this is a picture of uh, a honeybee there with, with the propolis. One of my very...
Lisa, did, did there you have a question? There were two questions um, earlier, and I just wanted to go back to them if you are willing. Sure. One was, how do you ever, how did you get an, interested in bees? And then the second one was about queens. So they're not born a queen. The workers can manipulate a regular bee into being a queen. Yeah, so right. I'll, I'll address the queen question. Yeah, uh, uh, any egg can be chosen, can be selected to become a queen. There are some, uh, some factors that influence it in the colony. There'd have to be a good reason to overthrow the queen, but it happens, uh, it happens occasionally if she's failing, if she's old or not laying properly or running out of, um, of, of sperm that's collected in her spermatheca, they will overthrow her in a process called supersedure. And in that process, they just select a queen and they, uh, an egg and they, they, uh, they, from the very beginning, treat it as if it's going to be their new queen. And then the other is in a swarm situation where they draw cups that are at the bottom of the frames, and then the queen will go lay an egg in those. And so it's a much more ideal space for a queen to be raised, and there are often many. So when the colony swarms, there can be, I, I had one colony have over 80 uh, virgin cells, uh, cells for queens to be reared, and it was ridiculous. Uh, but usually you get about 10 of these cells, and that way they have some spares if, if there were any damages there. So, uh, and then the other question, how did I get into beekeeping? Uh, I grew up in Montana, and a couple blocks away, we had a commercial beekeeper, and, and I was, a, I was, I was a tomboy. I was always very interested in things I shouldn't be interested in. And science was definitely one of those things that piqued my, my curiosity. And so uh, I was told, my parents told me, don't go there. You, you know, they have bees and it's dangerous. And so I'm pretty sure I was poking through the little knot hole on the privacy fence, um, trying to see what was going on back there. And then the other thing, I'm going to date myself, uh, there was a program called 321 Contact in probably the early 80s. And yeah, <laughs> and uh, there was a segment on, on uh, ant colonies and bee colonies. And I remember wanting an ant colony so bad. And, uh, but then they also had a segment on bees and I remember them Having, I remember the queen, and to this day, I can remember the queen walking around in there with a number on her, and just something about that program really sold me on beekeeping. So uh, I was much older uh, when I did actually start it. I moved out here from, from Colorado in 2010, and uh, a couple of years later, picked up beekeeping through a class. So um, no going back. I, I just, I, I love it. I um, it's, I've, I, I, personally, I've struggled to find meditation, um, relaxing and balancing and being able to focus my mind. And I, I've discovered that beekeeping is the place where I can really get centered. And um, so it turns out I needed to be among stinging insects to get my mind to stop talking back to me. Uh, <laughs> I guess. Um, so hopefully that answer your questions. I hope y'all are having a good time and uh, learning lots. So, um, you know, I, I apologize. My TV has been turning itself on randomly. Uh, it did it at four o'clock last night. So let me just, uh, let me just take a pause. Just while Maggie's stepping away, um, I'll know we put into the chat the MPT episode that was mentioned earlier. Uh, so there's a link to that in there, and we'll include a link to that um, on the page when we, we post the final video from this. Thanks, Carter. Thank you. Sorry about that. If anyone knows how I can get my smart TV to stop turning on, uh, please email me. 
Uh, so this was one of my first experiences as a beekeeper. I got a call for a feral tree colony. And uh, so these are some photos. There's uh, some screen on the, the logs there. Um, this is what it looked like inside uh, the comb there. This was a spring, a spring colony. So they, they were pretty much out of honey here. You can see the combs are, are empty. And then we uh, used a chainsaw to cut through the log and expose the, the combs. And then we cut out the combs and rubber banded them into empty frames, just to, the rubber band to provide some support and stability. And we were actually able to find the queen in this mess, this sticky, sloppy mess. It doesn't, like once you start, cutting and the honey starts rolling out, it does get really messy. But you can see the rubber bands there. You see there's a McDonald's bag and a face looking into that. Um, we found the queen and we weren't prepared. We didn't have a queen cage for her. But this man, Scott, who had hauled the log over, had his truck there and he couldn't find anything to put the queen in except his McDonald's bag. So here, here we are letting her out with her, with her bees there. This was a really great experience for me. Here's another photo of a tree that fell in DC right by the power lines. You can see there's a bucket up there. I was actually collecting comb and bees there. Uh, and then this is, these, this is a photo there. All right, so we are going to talk about products of the hive. I think we're running a little late, uh, so I'm going to I'm going to uh, push us through and um, hopefully keep everyone's attention here. So we'll talk about honey harvesting. This is the first photo on the left is showing the bees capping the honey. That is when the bees decide that the moisture content is low enough that it won't ferment. We all know about mead locally in our area. And mead was the one of the first alcohols that was discovered accidentally. It was some honey that had either been harvested before it was dried out, or it was honey that got water in it, and they discovered that it fermented. And hey, it tasted pretty good too. So uh, the bees will cap it, and it will stay good forever, which is uh, one of the reasons why finding the honey in the pyramids, it's still good. It never goes bad under the proper conditions. If it gets wet, it's definitely going to ferment. But if it's stored uh, away from air or capped, just like this, it will never go bad. Um, so we see harvesting is removing the capping with a hot knife or a paddle. And then the bottom left photo is what, what the clean honey looks like capped. And remember using the queen excluder so the queen doesn't go up there and lay any eggs. See the, the difference in the color. Uh, sorry, make everybody seasick. Um, okay. So just a lot lighter frames. See how dark these this comb is? That's because it's had brood and brood casings in it. Whereas the honey, the honey frames, it's all very clean and pure and and nice and white. So this frame actually got entered in the uh, Montgomery County Fair and actually placed um, uh, grand champion. So beautiful capping. Once you've removed the wax cap, you put it in a centrifuge and spin it out. And for me, I don't, I, I don't filter. I use a filter and do something called straining. Commercially filtering, they uh, superheat the honey and kill any sort of good stuff in it. And then they force it through a micro filter. And so for me, I just strain it to get little bits of wax out or um, you know, if there's any, any other debris that might have gotten in there, a blade of grass or something that got, got through in the process of harvesting, that gets strained out. So you can see pictures of my extractor and the process there. I just want to talk briefly about um, 
what we're buying in this store. I think we've heard a lot about adulterated honey. This was a, an exact picture from an event I was attending and they were selling sopapillas or something. And I remember um, seeing this, this bottle of honey there. And I just wanted to highlight uh, a couple of the things, 45% honey, and then the rest is high fructose rice syrup and then rice syrup and uh, they you know it was produced and they clearly didn't have spell check um, but yeah so th this is sometimes you'll see the dollar bin at some grocery stores where you can get honey just be careful because it's probably a syrup you just have to look real closely at the label and, uh, and the other thing is the USDA does not have an organic honey standard for the for the United States so uh, beekeepers or sorry, uh, customers will often ask me if my honey is organic. And because of the USDA requirements, I can't act, nobody in the US can uh, get certified organic until USDA creates a honey standard. So if you're purchasing organic honey, it did not come from the US. Uh, United States Department of Agriculture may have uh, inspected it or had an associate inspect it, but it won't be a product of the United States. And in this case, it's uh, Brazil and Canada. Uh, the beekeeper is from the United States, so it all gets very tricky. And then there are some rules about you can label your honey where it, where it was actually bottled, not where it was produced. So just some things to be uh, aware of and um, you know, another reason to support your, your local beekeeper. Here are just some photos uh, that were taken professionally after uh, when I first started and was entering fairs. Uh, so we'll just jump to the threats to the colony. I've mentioned the Varroa destructor, and I have a photo of that on the bee on the left. And for me, I think about this in terms of size. If if a human had this uh, same size creature on them, you know, we think about ticks and Lyme disease and how much damage a little teeny tick on a human body can cause. But look at how enormous these these varroa mites are. And would that be like the equivalent of having a squirrel sucking on us or a cat? I'm, I'm not quite sure, but they're really big and they're causing a lot of destruction and death of colonies. So um, we've got some really great researchers at the University of Maryland that are doing a lot of studies about them. Samuel Ramsey just got hired uh, in, um, in, in Colorado. He's going to Boulder now and doing some research, but he studied the mite uh, a lot and learned that they're actually feeding on the liver of the honeybee, which uh, is pretty interesting how that all works. The next threat is the small hive beetle, and they uh, have a tendency to get into weaker colonies and lay their eggs in, um, in the pollen, and they create just the slimy, gross mess. And if they take over, the bees will actually abscond. They'll just abandon everything in their colony and just run away. And then the third, the bottom photo is wax moths. And Though they can also be a threat to comb that's unoccupied or weak colonies, but they're also kind of cool in the sense that if we think about a feral colony, like a tree that has bees in it, and we think if those bees die, we have this natural organism, this, this wax moth that'll go in there and just eat through all of the, the wax and just return it basically to ashes in the bottom. And then the bees can start fresh again when a new colony of bees moves in. And so that gets rid of any sort of pests or uh, disease issues there. And just, you know, it's basically a way to keep the shell of the house uh, without, without um all the furnishings that might be contaminated. So they're pretty, pretty fascinating. Um, and then quickly, we'll talk about things you can do to help uh, avoiding the use of pest, avoiding the use of pesticides, hand weeding. Uh, there are lots of alternatives that you can use. Learning to love dandelions and clover because bees rely on their nectar, especially in early spring when the main nectar flow hasn't begun. 
one, one thing people are surprised by is learning that just because they use something that's organic doesn't mean it's safe. And actually, some pesticides are more lethal. Um, some organic pesticides are more lethal than their man-made alternatives. Permethrin and permethrin are a perfect example of that. The organic is much more lethal than the man-made. If you see a swarm, contact a local beekeeper or an association, and you don't need to spray it or try to kill it. They're, I hope we've demonstrated that they're docile. They're just looking for a new home. If you have a neighbor who keeps bees, take, uh, take, a ch take some time to talk to them, and you can read more about the threats to bees and ways that you can help. There are two websites here, pollinator.org and the pollinatordefense.org. Planting a garden, even an herb garden or a condo balcony are helpful, primarily fall, fall flowers, for example, asters and things that are blooming later. The bees are primarily foraging in the trees and the native trees early in the year, tulip poplar, basswood, um, black locust. They're, they're getting the main forage in the, in the main flow from mid-April until maybe mid-June, they're getting that all from the big trees. So consider planting things that bloom in the fall. Uh, and then don't be afraid. We need, we need bees. We even need wasps. Every, every creature has its place. So here are a couple books that I really enjoyed. And I can make these slides that, you know, it's, I think this is recorded, but um, can make these available too. Um, and for people who would like to start beekeeping, you can take a short course. These are often taught by volunteers through local clubs, and they're very inexpensive. The Bowie Upper Marlboro Beekeeper Club, which is the Prince George's County Club, they offer a class with a textbook in the $75 range, all volunteer taught, so you can trust that, um, that they're not, you know, that they have your best interest. Um, and they will help get you matched with a mentor, which is incredibly important. This is tough to do on your own. Um, and then if you do start or if you are still interested, you can subscribe to a professional publication. There are three or four beekeeping magazines that some come out every month. There are blogs and seminars, conferences, lots of meetings nationwide, uh, worldwide, even uh, as Lisa indicated, I've done a lot of beekeeping stuff throughout the, throughout the world. And being a good steward for bees is, is very important. Sharing a photo of my bee yard and a year I grew pumpkins for an experiment. This is a picture of the bees in the winter after a good snowstorm. There's some links, uh, including the, the Bowie Upper Marlboro Club, the DC Club, and then the Maryland State. Again, I can make this uh, available through a handout or something. Um, my hair was so much shorter before the pandemic. Yeah. All right. Well, we it. do have some questions. Um, and let me go back to the beginning here. Karen Brown says, your products are stupendous. The honey is fantastic and the lip balm is luscious. Everything I've tried has been top notch. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So that wasn't really a question, but kudos. Um, Flawn and Vicki raised a question. Do you have a picture of the queen excluder or describe, can you describe how it works? Oh, I have a just a solid board with holes that are small enough that, so that the queen can't pass through. Yeah, so uh, a, an example that Vicki should associate with is back in the old day when refrigerators were metal uh, grates instead of the plastic ones. If you think about that as a queen excluder, that, that's what they look like. They're generally metal and those slats are just wide enough that the queen can't get through, but the worker bees can. The drones can't get through either, but that, that's not a big deal. You did have a picture of it, did you not, earlier on? I only have a picture of yes. the edges. Ah. Okay, so, um, 
I don't know if they have an additional question to that, but Cheryl Mawo asks, um, Oops, where do you go, Cheryl? Where oh, I we, see. Where can we buy your honey? Uh, Franklin's has it, as well as the Brentwood, uh, the Brentwood store at the arts artist's place on Route One at roughly 39th Street. That that uh, that's such a great store there too. They have lots of local artists productions there and uh streetcar 82 now is selling it streetcar 82 and i have done a couple collaboration brews they have one on tap right now called the buzz and lager and it's made with uh with my honey in fact we did a harvesting demonstration at the brewery in may and people got to spin out honey i think we'll do that again in the future it was a lot of fun and it was nice for me to have helpers uh do all the work while i stood around drank beer <laughs> so, <laughs> um betty dickerson raised a question um can the bee threats hurt humans also Oh, you're talking about the pests, the varroa, and yeah. So, uh, no, those those pests are not a threat to humans. In fact, there is something called European fowl brood as well as American fowl brood. And those are two difficult diseases that the state apiary inspector is testing for. In fact, the dogs that come out in my in to the apiary to sniff. They are uh, sniffing for that disease and it can be carried in the honey, but it's actually not something that affects humans, but it's very lethal to honeybees. So uh, we're, we're very protected. There's not anything I can think of that, uh, that can hurt us uh, with the exception of botulism. And there's a really good medical doctor in Virginia that spoke on infant botulism in honey. We all know that you're not supposed to feed honey to infants under one year. And it's really fascinating, the science behind that. Apparently something magical happens in an infant's body where at 12 months, they can suddenly fight botulism. Uh, but they shouldn't get honey before they're 12 months old. But that's the only, that's the only, uh, and botulism in honey is super rare, uh, but that that's the only threat I can think of. Okay. Um, Karen mentioned, uh, Karen Brown mentioned that it's the Brentwood Arts Exchange that has your, that has your honey. Um, Thanks. It's, there's, there's something interesting about speaking and how your mind just, uh, just vanishes what you want. Uh, Carter asks about the plants. Yeah, I think asters are a really great option. Native trees. Uh, I am so fond of the black locust tree. Linden trees are beautiful and amazing, but the, the black locust really, I really love so much. Uh, I have a lot of seeds and seedlings and different things in my yard. I've gotten rid of all of my grass in my front and backyard and uh, just have mostly native plants there, uh, milkweed, uh, the, the asters, the coreopsis, um, uh, the- Bone flowers. Yes, the echinacea, mm -hmm. lots of different things you can plant. But if you can plant a tree, if you can plant a black locust or a tulip poplar, uh, even a red bud, one of the native trees are really helpful. How about a river birch? Will that count? I would have to, I, I don't know the Eastern trees as well. I don't know uh, what the, does the birch flower, river birch? I don't think so. So it's the flowering, uh, the flowering trees. Okay. Um, so there's another question. Do bees like four o'clocks, wildflowers or rose of, uh, rose of Sharon? So four o'clocks are those the are they also known as? Uh, I d I don't know what a four o'clock is. Is it like a pansy? I don't know, Cheryl. You should uh, unmute yourself and tell us what a four o'clock is. I have a whole bank of them across from the, the front of my yard. And they they have white flowers and uh, sometimes purple and sometimes yellow and sometimes striped, and and they kind of have a deep throat. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I, I think the, the best way to find out is if you see bees on them. And it's not all about the honeybees. It's, uh, it's, it's, about, it's about all the native bees in Maryland. There are over 400 native bee species. Really fascinating to think about. So um, if you don't, I think the honeybees are fine. They're being managed primarily, you know, most of them are being managed. There may be some feral colonies out there, but um, I think they're finding enough to forage. But I, I think we should take some time to really focus on the native pollinators and, you know, um, milkweed for even uh, the monarchs. And we, some of us forget that bats are wonderful pollinators as well. So um, the Rose of Sharon, I don't, the roses, the honeybees are generally not on roses. They, uh, they're also not on azaleas, but there are a lot of other native bees on azaleas. And just wildflowers in general, I think native wildflowers are a wonderful choice for gardens. I think any of the natives, you can't go wrong with scattering a native mix. Hibiscus. Uh, I, I, hibiscus. I, 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 I'm not quite sure about that. Um, I feel like, is that the more uh, tropical hibiscus? I'm thinking of the hydrangea and um, I think hibiscus is more of a, a tropical plant. Yeah. Cheryl, we can talk more offline. And, and my response would be to just Google, um, you know, to Google these for a plant expert on um, – Oh, hibiscus is the same as rose. Okay. So I have one of those in my yard and I don't see honeybees on them, but I do see a lot of bumblebees, bigger bees. And uh, one really fascinating uh, thing about bumblebees is they have a, a, a vibrating pollination process and they actually pollinate eggplant. They're like the only thing that can pollinate some of these really deep flowers. And so they cl- climb all up in the eggplant and they just, they vibrate all of the, uh, the pollen out of it. Just, it's, it's really fascinating how, how some bees just are not equipped to pollinate these. Um, one other plant that I would recommend is the mountain mint. That's a fall, a fall blooming smells really good. I have a ton of that. If, um, you know, no need to buy it. I can, I can leave some out front for anyone who wants some of that. And it, it smells really beautiful and the bees really love it all native bees as well in in the uh, fall i noticed in the garden in the community garden the other day i have a lavender plant and it was just covered in bees they looked like bumble they looked bigger they looked like bumblebees uh it was just huge and they certainly did not attack me they were you know they were all over and there i was and we were fine together. Yeah, and I remember when the cicada killers came into the community garden and they they keep their nests underground and they're huge, they're inches long. And I remember just being so terrified, but they, they had no interest in stinging. So it's, I actually allowed some European hornets to nest a couple years ago and I, I just had an agreement with them like, we're fine. You can stay until there's one sting and uh, everything, everything went fine. You mentioned, uh, and I guess I mentioned in the introduction that you raise um, g- uh, gentle bees. How, how are you doing that? I mean, is that just from the way you're treating them or do you think they're generally gentle anyway? I think, I think there are certain strains that are more gentle. gentle. For example, the Russian uh, breed of honeybees is considered to be a bit more defensive and uh, carniolians and European and uh, sorry, Italian honeybees are thought to be more gentle, more docile. But um, I, I think not buying commercial queens, not buying queens that are being imported from the South where they might have some, uh, some Africanized genetics. So uh, one, probably getting into a little more detail here, but Africanized bees, uh, Africanized ED, uh, came as a hybrid of uh, a 
research study where European and African bees were cross mated. And the resultant of that was a very aggressive defensive bee. But uh, working in Kenya, I worked with African bees, true African bees. And I was actually a little bit disappointed that I didn't get a sting because uh, I wanted a badge of honor, uh, an African bee sting. Uh, but uh, they they were fine. I uh, have a, a talk that I put together on my trip to Africa, working with beekeepers there and traveling the country and having a really great opportunity. Where so and the the difference is Belize has Africanized bees. So those are the cross between African and European bees, and they have different characteristics and they can be a lot more defensive. So uh, for me, I think just focusing on the genetics, if I have a colony that's a bit more defensive, I'll cull it. I, uh, you know, have bees on a small footprint. And if my neighbors were having problems with defensiveness or stinging, then I would certainly want to mitigate that. And uh, I've been contacted for people who have colonies that are defensive and they've actually purchased bees just knowing that mine are much more gentle. Um, I, I, I don't work with a lot of other beekeepers locally to know if their bees are um, really mean, but, mm -hmm. but my, I've been told that uh, my bees are really gentle and working in a t-shirt uh, certainly, certainly supports that. Um, I don't see any other 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 questions that you see, Carter. I don't see any. Hey, Karen, thanks for remembering the Brentwood Arts Exchange. Uh, and Cheryl, thank you for your comments. And Karen um, also said she would love to hear more about your Kenya trip. Thanks. It was. Wanna, we've got a little bit of time, so if you want to talk a little bit more, that would be great. Uh, so the Kenya trip was absolutely amazing. Uh, my first week, I went on a solo trip and had a, a private driver. I uh, it didn't. It was very inexpensive to get my own trip uh, with a private driver. And so uh, my talk has so many pictures about the safari I went on, and my driver took really good care of me. I'm still in touch with him. He's just a really nice man and uh, has really struggled through the pandemic, uh, as I'm sure a lot of the tourism industry worldwide has really, really struggled. So uh, the second part of the trip was uh, 15 days with an American contingent. We worked with a professor out of Nairobi University, and he uh, he took really good care of us. We we really went from one end of Kenya to the other, starting out in Nairobi and going almost to the border of Somalia. We we were planning to go even deeper, but it was. Uh, it was right around the time the U.S. had killed Soleimani and Soleimani, and it was not really safe for uh, for the Americans. There was a lot of border patrol there, a lot of armed guards. Uh, we had our our bus walk through just to you know make sure we were uh, not not terrorists uh, going into Somali. So that was that was pretty scary, and I felt. It was probably the scariest part of the trip was all the checkpoints and having the military, the Kenyan military, going through our our bus and looking in our belongings. It just it just felt uh, it just felt scary. But found the Kenyan people are incredibly helpful, very happy. I think uh, one of the things I told Peter, my driver, was that it's the happiest population of people for having so little mm -hmm. and it just it i think it really opened opened my eyes opened my heart uh to learning about how happiness is an inside job and uh, how you want to surround yourself with people that make you the happiest and uh just you know it's just really wonderful and coming from a place of being a minority going through these little teeny towns, the further we got outside of Nairobi, the less frequent it was to encounter white people. And I didn't see it. I didn't recognize that I was different uh, 
from you know from them but like the little kids walking along the the roads uh, along the highway that that's their path to and from school and so they they would just break their necks staring at me and waving and i was a little bit uncomfortable and i finally asked peter why and he said um you know the white people have really helped the people of kenya and it's uh, you know, they, they're so used to ministries coming and they just, they really appreciate all you've done and building schools and helping. And I learned that in the second part where we visited a school that this uh, same American contingent had helped build and provide a well and how people from all over the community would come and utilize the water and um, just not not having, for me, not having any any sense of what it must be like to not have safe, clean water. Like, wow, you know, yeah. it's so uh, one of the other really amazing opportunities was going to a village where a man and his brothers and his sons uh, and a, a couple daughters had, um, they lived and this man built the Kenyan top bar hives and, he, and a, uh, so some of the American contingent had been there several times before, and they they had these special, beautiful chisels that they brought to him because he was using whatever he could find in terms of tool ken tools. Kenya doesn't have Home Depot or building supplies. They have a lot of used stuff. They have a lot of used bikes. They don't they don't have a really good uh, infrastructure to get good things, and especially to these incredibly rural areas. So. The guys had brought chisels and we brought books and soccer balls for the kids and reading materials. And the, the, I remember I brought a bag with maybe a hundred pens that I had collected over the years, just regular ballpoint pens from banks or motels or hotels or wherever. And, and I, you know, I, brought the bag out and the kids were fighting over the pens. Like it was just, cause it's not that easy for them to get something as simple as a pen or writing implement. So uh, just really eye opening. And even if they had the money to get a soccer ball, there might not be a place to buy it or um, so just, just really fascinating. And then they, uh, they slaughtered a goat for us that morning and uh, cooked it and had this amazing meal for the Americans. And it was, you know, it was clear that they, this was a really big deal. And so I, uh, it was very touching and their standard of cleanliness was so surprising to me. Not that, not that we should be surprised, but their level was above and beyond what we see at potlucks here where the they had hot water uh, coming from a cooler like a you know a, a Gatorade cooler and then soap right there and just this hand washing station that was so surprising you know before COVID but just their level of care and concern uh, about you know just health and safety and good practices it was it was surprising for some place so remote but um just really touching how um you know how poverty affects people and how 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 we can help in little ways and uh, just just so so many pictures and just such a great experience i'd love to talk about it again with this group I think we'd love to have you come back and do that. That'd be great. Um, lots of thank yous on uh, in the chat. Um, that's been a fascinating presentation. Really fabulous, Ann Barrett says. Thank you very much. Um, if there are no more questions, um, I just want to say that we will be back here. I want to thank Maggie for this presentation. It was really, um, I, I learned a lot. and. Uh, helps me know more about 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 hives um, and about honey uh, and I really appreciate it um, I, I just want to say that we will be back here with um, corridor conversations on July the I'm fine, trying to find my notes July 16th at 2 p.m. with Blue Sky Puppet Theater um, 
and we'll be announcing other programs very soon. So thank you very much again, Maggie. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Be safe, everyone. Yeah. Be, be safe. E.